thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to pay my respects to the ancestral spirits of the traditional owners of this country, the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to my own ancestral spirits because if it had not been for their strength, I would not be here today. So I'm paying my respects to them. My mother was Aboriginal and New Zealand. My father was uh, African Canadian uh, and Scottish. He was illegitimate like all of us were. Uh, sometimes I think about how lucky I've been to have had the career I've had. But most of all, I reflect on my early childhood growing up as I did in Melbourne. I was born in Carlton in the slums. I my sister and I were kept together. The five of children were split up and we were taken away from our parents in 1939. Um, I have a brother I've never met and a sister that I haven't seen since she was 10. Uh, my elder sister, who's passed on, and I were kept together. We were dumped in the Royal Park Welfare Depot and uh, the first thing I remember was we were taken to a large bathroom and sat on high stools and our heads were shaved and then we were put into a bath which smelt like it had sheep dip in it. it was, and then our heads were wrapped in bandages that had been soaked in kerosene to get rid of any of the lice eggs. Well, we were there for about six months, I think, and uh, we were given to uh, a man who had a farm in the northwest corner of New South Wales. He proceeded to rape Mag and me for five years. Um, he had, I was crippled during the war. I was sent to the Royal Park, uh, sent to the Royal Far West Home in Manly. Uh, Mag told a little girl at school what this man was doing to us. The little girl's father was the only policeman in Byron Junction, which was the small town where we were, really the back of Burke. Um, he went to jail eventually. Uh, we were sent back to live with our mother, who was still a drunk and living with another man, and I became a street kid. I've had no formal education at all. I became a petty criminal, a thief, and a pickpocket, and a rent boy. When I was 17, I was arrested at a party, and uh, in 1951, I was charged and found guilty of the abominable crime of buggery. And I was sent to Pentridge Jail, where two of the guards raped me. When I got out, my mother told me that I didn't have to use the name uh, of my father that I grew up with. I could use the name on my birth certificate, which was Tovey. And I went down and I got a copy of my birth certificate, and there was my name, Noel Christian Tovey. And I realized that in that instant, I could have the dream and make the dream a reality that Noel Christian Tovey couldn't. So I, I, I made my professional debut in a musical for J.C. Williamson's in 1954. Um, now, I found this out uh, at a reunion in 2010 
nine of the boys and girls went to the English choreographer and said they didn't want to work with me, that I was a notorious homosexual, that I'd been in jail, and that I was Aboriginal. And it wasn't easy, but I eventually I went overseas. And uh, I had a career which, which many Australians would be proud of. Uh, and I opened an art gallery for my lover, Dave, uh, which became a huge success and will be in the annals of decorative arts forever. What I'd like to do is, uh, I'm not going to actually tell you about or read to you about my activist days when I was, I went to the Stonewall riots, I was beaten up by the police, I have a scar on my head uh, from bleeding and we retreated into um, another bar. But I'll tell you about Dave. He was my lover for 17 years. Uh, the first 10 were amazing. The seven that were left were not so amazing. When I was in Australia, Dave moved back himself back into my flat. He had a builder come in and knock down two walls. I was furious when I returned. I always have a problem with jet lag, and that morning was no different. The flat was in a total mess. He'd had an argument with the builder who'd walked out the day before. We had an appalling row. I told him that I'd had enough of his philandering and let him know that I knew several of his lovers were friends and clients of ours. I made it clear that the business could no longer support his comings and goings. He lost his temper and stormed out, saying that he was going to stay next door in Kathy McDonald's flat. Kathy was home in America and Dave had a key to the flat. I thought he was going to, in there, to calm, cool down and give me some space to get over my jet lag. I had a shower and went to bed. Next morning, I went into Kathy's flat to try and make amends for the row, as I always did, and found him in the bathroom covered in blood. He'd cut his wrists. I telephoned a close friend, and he drove Dave to the hospital. Luckily, the cuts weren't too deep, but he did require microsurgery, and he never regained full use of one hand again. I called Geraldine Fitzgerald in New York and told her what had happened. She said she had a friend in Key West and that Dave should go there. He was away for about a month. When he returned, we both knew that things would never be the same again. For the next year, we ran the business together and occasionally we would go with friends for dinner. I was losing interest in the gallery, but I couldn't just close it. The overdraft was huge and I didn't want to make the wrong decision in haste. I went to New York for an auction. After the sale, I had dinner in the village with another dealer. And later that evening, we had a drink in a bar in Christopher Street. I saw a large poster on the wall advertising a circus performance to raise money for gay cancer. I asked my friend what gay cancer was. He told me that it was a new cancer that was killing young gay men. I remember we both laughed when he said we were too old to get it. <laughs> Such was the ignorance surrounding the virus in those early days. In Times Square, there was a rally with a preacher proclaiming over a microphone that the new cancer was the will of God to, get to destroy all homosexuals. The first inkling I had of Dave's illness was the day he showed me a bruise on his leg I had no idea what it was, and I didn't connect it to the cancer. He saw several doctors, but all they could tell him was that he did have a blood disorder and that probably contributed to the bruising and gave him cortisone cream to put on it twice a day. But they didn't have any answers to what was causing it. That summer, we drove down to Cannes to meet our friend Michael Bastow 
who is now living with Catherine de Capel in Brussels and go to the film festival. We had, uh, we'd been given a small uh, penthouse which overlooked the croisette for the occasion. Well, it was more or less a studio. Oops, sorry. But it had an enormous terrace that I was looking forward to entertaining our friends on. But what should have been an enjoyable holiday was marred by Dave's unusual behavior. He was very lethargic and spent most of the day in bed. We went to several antique shops that we knew, but he just wasn't interested in buying anything. When we returned to London, my fears that something strange was attacking his body and brain became a reality the day he drove down the wrong way in Bond Street, a one-way street in the heart of London. He insisted that he was the only one going in the right direction. I was alarmed by his increasingly odd behavior, and I called Alana, Chris Day's friend. She was a senior nurse and worked at the STD clinic at St. Mary's Hospital. I told her of my fears for Dave. Together, we worked out a plan whereby he would have the latest test for the new virus. News was already coming out about my friend Rock Hudson's illness, and I thought Dave was suffering from the same disease, whatever that was. Anya and Rodney, two dealers we know who had, we knew, had just arrived from Australia, so I gave dinner for them, as I, I usually did. I invited Alana, Chris, and David Green, a young psychologist from New Zealand, and his wife, Jane. David was very dynamic, tall, fair, full of energy, and was determined to dispel the myths surrounding the virus. The first time I went to see him at Westminster Hospital, where he held weekly clinics for patients and their loved ones, he had a large photograph of a New Zealand rugby team in a fallen scrum printed on his wall. Someone had written on it, haven't these boys heard of safe sex? All we talked about during dinner was the new virus. Alana casually asked Dave about the bruise on his leg. When he told her that his doctor didn't know what was causing his blood disorder, she suggested that he come to the clinic and have the new test. I went with him. A nervous week followed for both of us. And when the doctors told him that he was positive to the new virus, he became inconsolable. He knew that there was no cure for what he had. He was admitted to a special ward in St. Mary's Hospital for further tests. The daily newspapers were full of the latest news about the virus and featured horror photographs of a new, very ill Rock Hudson. Finally, Rock came out and announced to the world that he was gay. A short time later, he died in Beverly Hills. The new uh, 20th century plague now had a name, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. The next few months saw the escalation of friends and dealers dying. It was like living in a nightmare. Edward Brayshaw, a young actor from Australia, came for dinner one night, and I couldn't believe my eyes. He looked and moved like a very old man. He lifted his shirt and showed me his chest. It was covered in Kaposi sarcoma. We both started to cry. Dave's condition was worsening, and I was feeling very angry with everyone and everything. The only conversation my friends had was about AIDS. Everyone I knew was terrified of the unknown, and the rumors of how to catch it were right. I telephoned David Green. I told him, that I felt like I was being forced to become a member of a club against my will. He told me he knew from his long talks with Dave about our relationship and that I didn't know him anything. In fact, he said that I had made it possible for Dave to have the sort of life other young men from the provinces only ever dreamt about. I knew that, but I decided to hear, uh, I. I knew that, but I needed to hear someone else say it. The conversation with David fired me up emotionally and enabled me to make the decision 
to look after Dave. Well, why shouldn't I? There was never a time since I first met him when I hadn't loved him. And I knew that this was somehow going to be a test for me. His doctors told me to use the hospital like an hotel and advised me to return him there when things got too stressful for me at home. I telephoned my agent, Marette, and told her the whole situation and told her that I would not be available to accept any offers of work in the theater for some time. She was very concerned for me and genuinely understood my position. I kept a close watch on Dave, taking him for his monthly checkups. In September, while he was having his blood taken for another test, he started talking absolute gibberish. I was totally shocked and had no idea what was going on. He was heavily sedated and put into bed. His doctor told me that he, he obviously had factor X. That was the only way he had of describing Dave's dementia, which abated while he slept. A week later, when he was reasonably well again, I took him home. But I needed someone to look after him for a few hours each day so I could tend to the gallery. It had been closed for several weeks, and I knew that if I didn't do something, everything I'd worked hard for, so hard for, would be lost. I rang the Terence Higgins Trust. They sent a buddy. His name was Adam. I didn't know it, but Adam the buddy was Adam Mars Jones, the journalist. He wrote a terrible article in The Observer about AIDS victims and their lovers, based on Dave and me. My accountant, Vernon Epstein, rang me to say that the VAT inspectors wanted to interview me in the gallery. He arranged the meeting with the customs officers, one man and one woman. Dave's name kept appearing on the books. I tried to sidetrack every question about him, but to no avail. When the young woman finally said, who and where is this mysterious Mr. Sowell? I replied, he is my lover, and he is in St. Mary's Hospital dying from AIDS. With that, they both stood up and announced the meeting was over. They refused to shake my extended hand. Vern and I laughed, and a few weeks later, he telephoned me to say that the VAT office had sent him a report saying that they were satisfied that I had not committed any breach. David Green told me I needed a break. He said that I really had to get my strength up for the weeks ahead. Dave is not going to die yet, he said, and suggested I go home to Australia for a holiday. I returned Dave to the hospital. I flew straight to Sydney. The house my friend Frances Laverack was renting was about to be sold. She was very upset, so I suggested we buy a house together. Frances worked for Rodney and Anya in, in their shop and often came to London on buying trips with them. We found a house in Surrey Hills. It was a single-story weatherboard house, probably built in the 20s. It had a lot of charm and character. It was a very hot January day, uh, January day when we went to look at it. Inside, it was quite dark. All the shutters were closed. The owners were Maltese and obviously very religious. Above each of the doors, was, were, was an electric crucifix that pulsated on and off. We loved it, and I suggested that we keep the crucifixes. <laughs> that afternoon, we went to the bank and arranged for a loan. Repaying it would be no problem for me. The exchange rate was very much in my favor. I flew down to Melbourne to see Mama, who was very frail and in a nursing home. While I was there, I arranged to see my daughter, Felicity, and once again, we had a fruitless meeting. She had another job and another boyfriend. She wasn't at all interested in talking about her mother or her family. I was not at all happy. I cut my stay short and returned to London. I went straight to the hospital and brought Dave home. He was in remission and it appeared to be quite healthy. He'd even put on a little weight. I told him about the house in Sydney and said that when he was well enough, we would 
go there for a holiday, I think we both knew that this would never happen. I organized for us to go to the opening of Sweet Bird of Youth and have dinner at, after the show at Mr. Chow's like we had done so many times before. We invited Victor Mutton and Peter Duff to come with us. Victor was Peter's lover and he knew Peter had been one of Dave's many lovers when Dave lived in Putney by himself. The four of us became friends when Dave was diagnosed with the virus. In the really dark hours of Dave's illness, I would call on Peter to help me get Dave back to the hospital. And he always came, no matter what time of the day or night it was. Not long after our night out, Dave had one of his attacks. My first reaction was to lock the doors. One night he let himself out and I found him half naked walking over Putney Bridge. He was on his way to Gay Millard's house. There were also some amusing moments. We had this ritual whenever we were invited to a first night. Dave would mix martinis while I was having a shower. This particular night, I put Dave to bed about nine o'clock, had my supper and went to bed myself. About two o'clock in the morning, he woke me. In the, he was in his evening clothes and holding two martinis. <laughs> he said, well, if you don't have your shower now, we'll be late for the theater. <laughs> I got up, showered and dressed. And then we sat in the living room and drank the martinis while I waited for him to drop off to sleep again. Then I put him back into bed. Whenever Dave had a seizure, it happened so quickly without warning. I never had time to put on the prescribed rubber gloves. I once found him crawling around on all fours, defecating on the carpet. I hurriedly undressed him, lifted him into a warm bath, bathed him, lifted him out, and gently dried him before putting him into clean pajamas and placing him in my bed. Then I set about cleaning and doing the laundry and cleaning the carpet. I hadn't slept properly for nearly six months. I was very close to a breakdown. I often had thoughts of killing Dave, then committing suicide. At each such times, I rang the Samaritans. It was always comforting to know that there was another person on the other end of the line who was just prepared to listen. I usually calmed down after I talked for about an hour and to my anonymous listener. Our friends in New York were also very supportive and were never angry when I called them in the middle of their night just to have someone to talk to. They were all very fond of Dave. Christmas 1985 was a sad affair for me and a birthday I will always remember. I invited Peter, Victor, Alana, Deirdre and my other two close friends for dinner. Dave was now gravely ill and I knew that they would want to be with him. He was extremely frail. His body had been totally ravaged by the virus. He had a catheter that was attached to a plastic bag on a frame and he could wheel it about. I joked about it being made by Fendi, one of his favorite designers. He was like a child with little or no memory or his intellectual faculties had gone some months earlier. I served small portions of Christmas dinner several times during the afternoon. Dave couldn't remember eating at all. We'd no sooner return to the living room when he'd turn to me and say, darling, what time are we going to eat? And we would all sit down at the table again. A friend telephoned from Paris to tell me that the doctors there were experimenting with a drug called cyclosporin. Other friends called me from America to tell me about AZT, but it was too late for Dave. I returned him to St. Mary's Hospital on Boxing Day. On New Year's Eve, I drank the champagne that Andre Blank had sent from Paris with his nurse. He was totally unaware of what day it was. His mind had completely gone. I told him that I would return the following day. When I did, I was very distressed to see him wearing an oxygen mask. I lowered it and I said, Dave, I'm going to end it today. I promised him that when we both find out what he had, that no matter what, 
I wouldn't let him suffer as so many of our friends had. Several colleagues of ours killed their lovers with an overdose of heroin to end their misery, and I was prepared to do the same for Dave. He knew and understood everything that I was said to him because for the first time in a long while, his eyes lost their manic stare and he smiled at me. And in a moment of absolute clarity, he said, aren't you glad we stopped having sex? I replied, no. His eyes filled with tears and those were the last words he ever spoke. My heart was breaking into small pieces. I walked down the hall and found the duty doctor and I said to him, it's time for Dave to go and I want you to help him on his way. Dave was placed on mechanical morphine pump. I sat by his bed for the next two days listening to its mesmerizing and hypnotic sound that has injected him with a steady stream of venom. David Green came to see how I was holding up. A few of our good friends popped their heads around the corner to see if I needed anything. Most of the people we thought were our friends showed their true colors and stayed away from the flat and the hospital when I made the decision to be open about Dave's condition. The fear now surrounding AIDS was unbelievable. I called Benny, Penny Lyon, she was a principal dancer in many of my shows, and told her that Dave was dying. She came to the hospital with her daughter Yasmin, who was just a few weeks old. She'd been born prematurely. Much to the surprise of the nurses who were attending Dave, Penny lowered Yasmin to his face and said, kiss Uncle Dave goodbye. It was a beautiful moment and still is a beautiful memory. On the evening of the second day, Dave started fitting, sitting bolt upright in bed, eyes closed, gesticulating wildly. I literally freaked out. I picked up one of his pillows, went to his doctor's office, and this time I said, if you don't kill Dave now, I will. The doctor asked me if I knew what I wanted him to do. He explained to me that it was illegal. I told him that, if, that I could do it if he couldn't. But after a, few brief after a brief consultation with another doctor, we walked back to Dave's room. I was asked to wait outside. Almost immediately, the doctor called me in and told me the whole Dave. He'd been injected in the heart and he died peacefully in my arms. It was miraculous how his body and particularly his face returned to their former beauty almost as soon as his last breath escaped. That was January 1986, a few weeks before his 40th birthday. When he finally died, I think my tears were those of relief that his terrible suffering was over. I knew that sharing his life and death had made me a stronger person. It may not have been the perfect relationship if there is such a thing, and maybe I should have ended it when I knew it was over. Perhaps I'd contributed to its downfall. I'd created in my imagination, and to a certain extent in reality, a relationship that Dave or anybody else for that matter would have found difficult to live up to. Someone once said to me, you teach a bird to fly, then you regret it when it flies away. I don't regret any of the decisions I made with Dave. He was my anchor at a time when I needed one. Together we had created Lodion, which would be forever and have a place in the annals of decorative art. And we had a lot of fun in the process. I'd also done my best work in the theater during our good years. Not long after he passed away, I found a tape from an old answering machine. It was Brenda Arno. Brenda was the leading lady, uh, um, uh, African-American lady in Calcutta. And uh, she was also in the film of uh, Live or Let Die. Not long after he passed away, I uh, he was a sucker for Brenda's little girl act and often gave her money without telling me. The last time I saw Brenda, she was walking barefoot down King's Road, muttering to herself. She looked like a very old crone. I later heard that she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital, suffering 
from paranoid schizophrenia caused by long-term abuse of drugs. She passed away in 1980, 89, from a brain tumor. I can only hope now that wherever they are, they don't need money. I became what is known as one of the well unwell. I was plagued by nightmares about my own death from the virus. I was convinced that somewhere along the way, I had become infected. I knew all the symptoms and signs that accompanied zero conversion from contact to the virus. And I felt sure that the sword of Damocles was waiting to strike me down. Every morning, I went through the body search, looking for any telltale sign of change. A brown mole that I had on my right leg from birth took on a sinister meaning. Had it become larger? Was the tinea that I'd suffered from all my dancing years a sign that my immune system was breaking down? David Green insisted that I have the new HIV test, which I did. He called me a few days later and he said, I know that you're not going to believe me, but your test was negative and you are quite healthy. Relieved by this news, I asked Peter Duff to work full time for me at the gallery. He had quite a knowledge and a love of decorative arts and frankly, I didn't want to run the business by myself again. Thank you. Thank you.